No better description than to begin our service than at Calvary, for it is at that place of Calvary where our sins were paid for, where redemption was made possible and available. And today we have gathered to celebrate in many forms. We're going to worship corporately together, declaring that truth. We're going to study the Word of God together, declaring that truth. And in a moment, we have the privilege of observing believers' baptism, which is a beautiful picture of that truth. For those of you that have gathered on our campus this morning, I just want to say thank you. And if you're a guest or a visitor, uh, we would ask you to do us a favor slash an honor. At the end of our service, we do have a guest reception. We'd love the privilege of giving you just a token of gratitude uh, for being here. But more importantly, we'd love just to meet you, to hear your story, to find out how the Lord brought you here. Maybe you're new to our community. Maybe you're visiting family or friends. We would love uh, the privilege. And for those uh, that are watching online, thank you again uh, for allowing us into your lives. I know that there are, in our world today, so many options and opportunities right now wherever you are, uh, but you're worshiping with us, and we don't take it for granted. We appreciate you being with us today. As I mentioned, at Calvary is really the crux of why we're here, and so we get the privilege today of celebrating with two baptisms. Mr. Paul Dunbar. Good morning, church. How are we doing? All right. Semi-awake. As I was driving in this morning and I was thinking about the baptism of these kiddos, sisters to be exact, I was wondering and curious like how many people sit in the audience every week when we baptize as a church and really aren't sure what's going on. And I thought, you know what, let me try and explain this a little bit better for anybody out there that's like, what, what, what is, why the water, why all of this? And so the first thing that has happened with these two girls is they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And they, they want to come before you as a church and this is a symbol of what Jesus did on the cross. We're going to bury them in the likeness of his death and raise them to walk in newness of life. But this water doesn't save them. The blood of Jesus does. This water is a symbol to declare to you publicly as a church that they love Jesus and want to live a life for Jesus. So if you've never done that or you were always curious, hey, go to the welcome desk and talk to one of the pastors. We'd love to talk more about baptism and just walking you through this process. And so first up, we have Miss Kate. Collins. She's one of the sisters. I'll let you decide who's older. There she is. How you doing? Good. So earlier this week, mom and dad gave me a ring and said, hey, I think the girls are ready to get baptized. And I said, perfect. Let's sit down and talk. Make sure that they've made the first and most important step, and that's to ask Jesus Christ. And so we visited, and, and I'm going to ask her the same question. I know this answer, but Miss Kate, has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you of your sins? Yes. All right. Well, what time is it? Miss Kate Collins is my sister in Christ. It gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. All right, next up, Miss Collins. Collins Pool with K. There are those parents like me that put the same initials, so that way it really makes it fun when you have to get their attention in some fun way. But Miss Collins, yes. Has there been, you, you're a little excited, aren't you? All right. Has there been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to save you? Yes. All right. You're excited. Miss Collins Poole is my sister in Christ. It gives me great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. I like to see that excitement. I thought for a moment she was going to baptize herself. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For the testimony of baptism, Lord, realizing that the only reason that we go under the water is a testimony to what you did on our behalf at Calvary. Lord, today as we are in this specific place at this specific time, you've given us a privilege, an opportunity to join the heavenly host in declaring not only who you are, but Lord, the opportunity to declare that how we have a relationship with you. And so Lord, today... As we declare these great truths, as we declare that you are the Almighty, the one who was and will always be forevermore. 
Lord, may we join the angelic realm. May we join the heavenly hosts declaring who you rightfully are today. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment. You know, over the last few days, there's a line we just sang that I couldn't get out of my head. No power of hell and no scheme of man can ever pluck me out of his hand. This week, we've read headlines we haven't read in 80 years. We've seen images that a lot of people have seen for the very first time in their lives. We've, we've heard reports of what's happening on the other side of planet Earth. It's the power of hell and the scheme of man lived out before our very eyes. And though there is global conflict that we don't know what tomorrow, much less next week or month, will bring, there's one thing we know. There are those commissioned with the gospel of Jesus Christ who are there. And oftentimes, it's when the world around you is falling apart that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most readily received, heard, and believed. Today's a day of great global conflict that we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but it's also an incredible opportunity to pray for those who are walking through what they're walking through and to pray for those who are sharing the gospel in the midst of what they are walking through. So today, I'm just gonna ask that you join me in praying for all that is happening in our world today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that more often than not, the plans and the schemes of man delve from the pit of hell more than they do the throne room of your glory and your grace. God, we also recognize that in the midst of these difficult, tumultuous, and very dark days, that the tomb is still empty, that the gospel is still true, and that your grace is still available. So God, today as a church family, we may not be looking out over the ocean waters, but we're looking out over a devastated land. May we, through your grace and the power of the cross, be able to declare that it is well with our soul. Help us, God, to walk in the power of your spirit and the confidence of your grace, knowing that your love is greater than any scheme of man. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Amen. Pray with me. Father, thank you that no matter the circumstances, whether it's in our world or in our lives, we can find a firm foundation with you. We can find hope. We can find peace. Father, we worship you. We thank you for your love. Thank you for the opportunity to give back, to share, so that your kingdom can be extended. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have prepared our hearts to hear from your word. Lord, this morning we recognize that that which we're about to read from, that which we're about to study from, that which we're about to preach from, Lord, has oftentimes been ridiculed, been mocked, and been treated the same way that you were treated in the story today. But God, I pray that we would see your word as not only that which was inspired from you, has been preserved by you, which is able to transform our lives and to change our course if necessary. God, I pray today that those who are in need of comfort, those that are struggling, those that are from a, an earthly perspective just barely getting by, God, I pray that you would comfort them with your word. And Lord, for those that continue to self-rationalize and justify and make excuses, God, I pray you would convict them from your word. God, today we pray that you would do only what you can do is take your spirit and your word 
and to change our lives. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to encourage you uh, to open your Bibles to two very specific places within the New Testament. The first is John chapter 18, the Gospel of John. We're going to spend almost all of our time in the Gospel of John chapter 18. But there's a brief moment uh, that I'm going to invite you to go over to Matthew chapter 27 as well. And for those of you that are first-time guests or visitors with us, let me uh, welcome you, invite you to a very specific journey through Scripture. Oftentimes, we take a respective book of the Bible or a theme of the Bible, and we take a journey throughout. But as we walk through this season of life, we're looking at a time period within the Gospels that is actually probably the most saturated time period within them. When you read through the Gospel accounts of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, oftentimes there's a story, a miracle, a message that one or more of them will share But when you get to the place where all four Gospels are describing the same event in quote-unquote different manners, you know that the focus has been heightened, and it happens in the last week, and most importantly, it happens in those last 24 hours of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Allow me to remind us before we go to John chapter 18, this is not just a study of events of 2,000 years ago. This is not a quote biblical history lesson, though although it may be, one of the things that we've noticed walking through these last 24 hours is that it's not a message that we can just leave back then. In fact, you're going to see particularly today how relevant this story is, not just for this day, but for coming days. In John chapter 18, beginning in verse 28, we're about to meet one of the most infamous men in the history of the world. A man by the name of Pontius Pilate. It said, verse 28, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but they might eat the Passover. And Pilate then went out unto them, and he said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, and they said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then said Pilate unto them, Take you him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. And then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. He called Jesus, and he said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of yourself, or did others tell thee of me? Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should be delivered unto the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault at all, but you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. One of the most famous stories, not only biblically in the history of the world, regarding a man who, though there is extensive history regarding his life leading up to this event, there's not a whole lot afterwards, and that's critical to the story in just a moment. But as we have in in previous weeks, I just want to walk through this passage asking some very strategic questions, building up to the why this story is so relevant for our lives today. Let's begin with the when. When does this happen? Well, technically speaking, it is at the break of day. Jesus was betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane about six hours prior to. He's been at the high priest Caiaphas's palace for almost six hours, where there they had to conjure up false witnesses because they could not find any ill in him. He was eventually accused of blasphemy. He was mocked. He was made fun of. He was denied by his own Simon Peter three times on the porch. 
What's coming next? It's the Roman phase. Technically, next week, we're going to meet a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene, a man who is displaced from his homeland, happened to be there in Jerusalem with his young family. And as the Bible says, he was compelled to bear Jesus' cross. We'll unpack all that next week. But when the, the win part is this, we're midway through. If you were to look at a strict chronology of the last 24 hours of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, this event that we just read is the midway point. We're 12 hours in, and there are 12 to go. It's the who that may be the most critical to today's study, to understand the what. We know who Jesus Christ is. We know his identity. We know his purpose. Uh, we know what the Lord has designed uh, for him to do. In fact, in John 17, he says, Father, I've done all that you've called me to do. But let's talk about this pilot guy. This was an individual that, for lack of better terms, was in a proverbial between the rock and the hard place. He was being squeezed. On the professional side, here is this Roman governor who's been relegated to the uttermost parts of the proverbial empire. In our terminology, he's basically a third-tier ruler who's been given one more shot not to blow it. Today's terminology, baseball, he's sitting on an 0-2 count. He's got no balls, two strikes, and he knows what's about to come from the mounds. He's in literally a no-win situation. If he sides with the Jews, there will be chaos. If he sides with the Romans, there will be chaos. And he knows professionally there's no way this can work out well for him. But then there's personally. This is the same man, though it wasn't in this account, whose wife came to him and said, I've had a dream regarding this Jesus of Nazareth. And the dream, in my dream, I've learned, do not touch him. Do not harm him. That's what I call between a rock and a hard place. You got your wife saying, you better choose Barabbas. You've got the world telling you it doesn't matter who you pick, you're in trouble. And so he's being squeezed professionally and personally. Then there's Barabbas. Notice how it ends in the Gospel of John's account is he was a robber. He's referred to as a male factor. If you'll back up into Matthew chapter 27, if you have it, I want to share with you what the Matthew account describes. And I think this is important to see with your own eyes, not just for me to refer to it. Beginning in verse 15 of Matthew 27, it says, Now at the feast the governors want to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. Listen to verse 16. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Notable He was not a first-time offender by any stretch of the imagination. The very fact that he was notable means there were multiple lines in the ledger. There were multiple occasions. In fact, throughout an understanding of who he was, the best way we can describe him in our culture today, I want you to imagine that the decision is between Jesus Christ and Charles Manson. That's who Barabbas was. He wasn't somebody who was at the wrong place at the wrong time and fall into the wrong situation. He was notable, purposeful, willingly. He was a vile, violent man. And then there's Jesus. But there's one more group of people, the Sanhedrin. These were the men that stayed up all night at Caiaphas' palace. These were the men who had to conjure up all these falsities to somehow get him to this place. And what would they do? They would stand before Pilate, Barabbas, and Jesus. And they would say, crucify him, referring to Jesus. And they would also say, may his blood be on us and our children. These men who claim to be righteous, These men who claim to be above reproach literally said, give us Barabbas. Now, I know that it may seem like a stretch, but you can put yourself in any position of faith anywhere in the world. Can you imagine a crowd that would choose Charles Manson over a local pastor? That's essentially what we see happening 
before us. So where does it happen? Notice it says in this passage that they gathered in the judgment hall. And of course the Pharisees were too self-righteous to go in there. But this is critical. Because what Pilate has done is he's taken Jesus before them. They've asked him to have him crucified, so he takes him back to the judgment hall. This is a private place. It's, imagine it's almost like going into his personal office, into his chambers, for a lack of better terms. And he begins to ask him in dialogue questions and concerns. Do you remember the movie Gladiator? It pictures the, the world in Jesus' day. And though, quote-unquote, historical fiction, there is this repetitive scene in that movie where the one that was in charge had the ability to either put his thumb up or down, and that would determine the fate of the one within the ring. That's what's happening. Whom we know as Pontius Pilate has brought Jesus into his inner chamber and said, do you not understand that when we go back out there, If I put my thumb up, you're free, proverbial speaking. But if I put it down, you will be crucified. So what happened? What happened in that judgment hall? What was said? Well, the first thing I want you to know is how personal the conversation was. Go into verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said, art you or art thou a king? Do you notice how personal this conversation is? Why is it so personal? Because Pilate knows his own person is on the line. See, in his world, this is bigger than Rome. In his world, this is bigger than Judea. This is bigger than the Sanhedrin because he knows That whatever decision is made, he knows whatever verdict is rendered will not only determine the temperature in his home, but also the potential of what his life, his career, and his own physical well-being will look like. Then I want you to see a picture. If you'll notice in verse 36, Jesus makes a statement regarding his kingdom. Now in just a moment... Some of your Bibles are going to have a very strategic word that I'm going to focus on. Those of you that do not have this word, it kind of gets around to the idea therein. Just work with me. Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Notice that focus, now. Can I give you the picture of what Jesus was painting in the judgment hall? Pilate, there's a day coming where not even Rome can stand up to what I'm going to do. There's a day coming where they can get every ruler, every leader, every soldier. It doesn't matter who you get. When I come in power, when I come in authority, you're not going to ask me if I'm a king Because according to Revelation chapter 19, inscribed on my thigh will say, King of kings and Lord of lords. But now, you see the picture? What Jesus is saying is, oh, that day is going to come, but that's not now, Pilate. Right now, I'm going to allow you to put a crown of thorns on my head. I'm going to allow you and your minions to mock me to make fun of me, to ridicule me, to beat me, and to falsely accuse me. Essentially, the picture he's given is, Pilate, I have the ability and the authority right now to save you from your predicament, but you've got to believe in me. Let's not worry about the artillery. Let's not worry about sovereign states of of lines and such. This is about you and your soul. But it's very prophetic. You say, we mean prophetic. We, we can't leave the story in the judgment hall. We can't leave it just as a historical account of Jesus and Pilate having this conversation. I want you to notice what Pilate says to him in verse 38. Pilate says unto him, what is truth? Now, for some of us, 
It seems like an arbitrary question, but let me kind of peel the layers away for a moment. Up until about 40 years ago, this seemed like a ridiculous question to ask. Because we know what is true, right? Truth is that which is not wrong, not in error, not false. In fact, the majority of our culture and our world for years and years and years has lived in a world that said, if it's true, it's true. If it's not, it's not. We use scientific investigation. We use logic. We use whatever means necessary to determine what is right, what is wrong, what is true, and what is not. And yet he asked, what is truth? I'll give you the academic term. Over about the last almost half century, we've created this term called post-modernity. It's a fancy word that basically means this. You can believe what you want to believe. I can believe what I want to believe. And even though they're in great conflict, it doesn't matter because truth for you is what is most important. Just because it's not actually objectively true has nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter that you can look under the microscope and see the biological distinction. You can do what you want to do because truth is up to you. It's subjective. Notice how prophetic Pilate was being. He asked a question that our whole world is asking in these, quote, last days. What is truth? Would you ever think that we would get to the place where the animals are smarter than the humans? Oh, we've been there. Don't you remember Noah? Let me ask you a question. What was the numerical difference between the animals and the humans? See, we've been down this road before. When we start justifying, rationalizing, and declaring, well, I don't care if it's objective. I don't care if it can be logically proven. It, it goes against my feelings. And it goes against what I want to be true. I got news for you. I want to have the build of a pro basketball player, but it ain't happening. It's not truth. So why? Why does this interaction in the judgment hall why is it so important for us to understand it? Not just from a personal level, from a picturesque level, from a, a prophetic level. Because it is personal. The pronouns used here are not accidental. They're not coincidental. Because you know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9? For we must all die and face the judgment. I got news for you. One day when you stand before God, it's going to be a very personal conversation. He, he doesn't care what your mom or dad think at that time. He doesn't care what your boss thinks or your employees think. And for those of you who say, well, I'm just going to tell him I'm a Baptist. That should be good enough. I got bad news for you. It's a personal conversation. And I don't know the exact wording that will be used, but I got a funny feeling that God himself is going to ask me this question. What did you do with my son Jesus? If I respond, well, but my wife, eh. But my church, eh. but my denomination, eh. the response has got to be my response. See, this is the picture I want you to see. Pilate isn't just a third-tier Roman dictator of years gone by. You want to see the picture? You're Pilate. You say, what do you mean I'm Pilate? Yeah, you're Pilate. You find yourself right now in the same predicament that he was in. On one side, you've got Jesus, the man who was perfect in all of his ways, a man who walked on water. He healed the lame and the blind. He miraculously multiplied the food and he spoke words of great truth. He died on a cross and he rose from the grave. On one side, you've got Jesus. On the other side, you've got all that sin can become in life. You do know that Barabbas probably wasn't that way in first grade, although he might have been. I don't know what kindergarten was like for him. But nonetheless, over time, his rebellion metastasized to such a point that he was a repeat offender. He was that one whom society was harmed greatly by. Isn't that really a picture of all of our lives? Do I pick Jesus 
Or do I pick anything else? Do I pick where I want to go? Do I pick where I think I'd like to go? Do I pick what I feel? Do I pick what would give me great benefit in one aspect? Or do I pick the one who says, if you follow me, take up your cross and die daily? And here's the picture. You and I are Pilate. We've got Jesus speaking into one aspect of our life. We've got this other sin thing speaking in. And guess who's standing right in front of us? The world. You know what the world is saying? Crucify him. The world is telling you, you don't need Jesus. The world is telling you, just do as you're inclined to do, how you're disposed to do, what you feel like doing. The world is basically shouting, you need to choose Barabbas. We are Pilate. And I know you're thinking, well, Pilate was a, was a no-win situation. You're absolutely right. You say, what do you mean it's a no-win situation? When John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus made this statement, that if we believed in him and followed him, that we would be persecuted and hated like he was. So it's a no-win in the sense that if we choose Jesus, we will choose the difficult path, the hard path. But if we choose Barabbas, then we've chosen hell for all of eternity. So I don't think it's really that hard of a choice. The question is, will we experience the pain and agony temporarily or will it be permanently? See, for you and I, the picture is that we are Pilate. You remember what his last action was? It's not in this account that we read. He comes out on the steps. He agrees with the world. And then he takes out a basin of water and he washes his hands. And he says, I wash my hands of this man. I, I got news for Pilate. Even though he may have said, I want nothing more to do with him, what do you think happened when he stood face to face with God? He asked him, so what would you do with my son, Jesus? Oh, I, I just washed my hands. That, that's not going to work. But it's also very prophetic. You say, how is it prophetic? You know, in John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking about the fact that he is the good shepherd. And there's a hireling, that one that crawls over the wall. And there's this analogy and illustration of whom we know is the enemy of Satan, being that vile one, what the book of Zechariah calls the idol, I-D-O-L, shepherd. And yet Jesus warned us over and over that not only does humanity naturally gravitate toward our sin position and against the things of God. Do you know the Bible warns us that there is coming one day in the future, there's going to be a personality that rises literally from the ashes. We collectively call him the quote, Antichrist. The book of Revelation calls him the beast. And you know what you see in John chapter 18 is exactly what the world is in the process of doing right now. The world has said, get the Bible out of the way. The world has said, get Jesus out of the way. Put him on the quote, proverbial cross. Give us Barabbas. Give us somebody who doesn't care what we do. Give us somebody who will actually promote our rebellion. Give us Barabbas. Because Barabbas, next time we do something we shouldn't do, his response isn't be, man, you beat me to it. Is that not who the world is craving right now? Anybody who will justify their sin and celebrate the rebellion. The world is craving Barabbas. And guess what? They're going to get him. The Bible says that he is going to show up one day. And when he does, his authority, his power, and his vileness will make Barabbas look like child's play. Right now, the world is faced of great conflict. The world is faced with great decision. And we have the opportunity as well. Do we choose the things of God or do we choose the vileness of the world? And what is the world saying? Give us Barabbas. This isn't just a story of 2,000 years ago. This isn't just a story of one man's pondering and perplexity. This is our story. And we're Pilate. And we have a decision to make. Who will we choose now? And who will we choose tomorrow? And we don't have the privilege of simply washing our hands. A decision must be made. Let's pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed.
as we gather not only in this place but online and on radio. Uh, maybe you're that person that from the beginning of the service, when you heard that tuned out Calvary and you saw the testimony of baptisms and you heard about the power of the cross, maybe you're that person today that the Spirit of God has been, been working on and moving in. And maybe it's by the reading and the preaching of his word that the Lord has gotten a hold of you this morning. And maybe you're that person today saying, you know what, I don't want to end up on the wrong side of history. I don't want to end up on the wrong side of eternity. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want you to notice, it doesn't say whoever becomes a Baptist will be saved. It doesn't say whoever repeats a certain phrase will be saved. It doesn't say whoever doesn't do this or does do that will be saved. It says whoever calls on the name of the Lord. In other words, that means just admitting and crying out that you're in a sin position that you cannot fix and that Jesus Christ, through his death and his resurrection, has accomplished all that needs to be accomplished to forgive you of your sins and to save your soul. If you're that person today, can I encourage you to cry out? It's not something that has to necessarily be out loud. It doesn't have to be the phrases that I or somebody else would use. This is your heart's cry before God. But maybe your cry will go something like this. God, today, I recognize I've got a sin problem. I've been places I shouldn't have been. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've said things I shouldn't have said. God, I have thought things that I should have never thought. And I understand that according to your word, the result or the wages of my sin is death. But your word also says that the gift of life is through Jesus Christ. God, today I want you to know I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he was willing to be born on my behalf. God, I believe that Jesus Christ loved me so much he lived a sinless life on my behalf. God, I believe today that he not only stood before Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod and multiple others, but God, that he went and allowed himself to be placed on Calvary's cross bearing the punishment of my sin. And God, I believe that three days later, when he rose from the grave, he made it possible for my sin to be forgiven. He made it feasible for my soul to be saved. God, today, I don't have all the answers to the issues, the struggles, and the conflicts that are happening within me and around me. But there's one thing I know, that I've got a sin problem only Jesus can solve the best way I know how. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I just want to turn my life over to you. With our heads still bowed, our eyes still closed, in a moment I'm going to pray for us. Then we're going to stand and sing together. And let me invite you. If you had that conversation with the Lord, we'd love to have a conversation. We'd love to celebrate just to pray with you and pray for you. Or maybe you're that person say, you know, I've already, I've already professed that faith. I've already believed on Jesus. But maybe like those young girls today, you need to fall in believer's baptism. We'd love the privilege of talking with you. Maybe you say, you know what, got all that covered. And maybe the Lord's brought you here from a different place. Maybe you've been here a long time. And the Lord has said, this is where you need to put your spiritual roots. Maybe today's the day you step out and step forward. We'd love to celebrate with you. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of decision, much like Pilate on the front steps of his palace, God, we, we don't have the privilege of remaining neutral. We have the decision to either be for you or against you, in your way or not. And God, we know deep down inside what your word and your spirit has told us. God, I pray right now you would silence the enemy and just allow us to respond to you personally the way you've called us to do so. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me as we have our time of invitation, whatever decision, we'll be right here at the front. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world. before me, the world behind me, no 
Church family, if you'll be seated for just a moment. I know there may be some of you this morning saying, man, I, I'd really, I'm walking through some things and, and it's going to take more than just two or three minutes. Well, we want you to know that we've set aside not only a specific place on our campus, but we've got a group of folks that would love to spend some time with you, to pray with you, pray for you, uh, whatever that may be. And so the opportunity to respond has not drawn to a close. In fact, in just a moment, Alan Jones is going to close our service after the benediction to my right, your left. Uh, you'll see some folks pretty easily identifiable. And I just want you to know that each and every week, almost after each and every service, we have folks that walk back there. We're here for you. We understand that sometimes it takes 15, 20, or 30 minutes to unpack some things. And that's why we've set this aside. We want to give you the time, the attention, and the space that you need to allow the Lord to maneuver and work in your life. In just a moment, we're going to have some video announcements uh, regarding some of the highlighted ministry areas of our church family. Just to remind you uh, that this is not all that is happening. In fact, this is just kind of skipping the rock across the proverbial water. If you'll go to our website, fbcopelica.com, or our app, you'll see the totality uh, of the ministry areas. In fact, speaking of, because it won't make the video, you may not realize it, but for the last 48 hours, there were over 500 college students from all around the state of Alabama that were sitting where you're seated, having an annual what they call the Pursue Conference. Something that probably very few of you even knew about because it never makes the video. These are just kind of the highlighted areas that kind of just skip across the top. We'd love you to drill down deep and be a part of all of it. Watch these quick announcements, and then Alan Jones is going to close us. I wish you could see the beauty of all this coming together. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Hello, First Baptist Church of Opelika. My name is Jamie Baldwin, one of your uh, former state missionaries, retired state missionaries, the State Board of Missions uh, in Prattville. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much, First Baptist, for your support of the work at Liberty Church in Craig, Alaska. This past year, we were able to spend about six months there working with construction teams and vacation Bible school teams, uh, uh, block party teams, and uh, through your support of prayers and giving, we were able to finish the education facility there at the church where they are now having uh, Sunday school and vacation Bible school and uh, discipleship classes. All kind of ministry is taking place in this church. We were able to go from running about six in ch church members to having about 35. As a matter of fact, they're having activities uh, about seven days a week there at the church where uh, in, prior to your support and prayers, uh, there was only something taking place on Sundays and Wednesdays. But because of your support, the full ministry is taking place there now. We're excited about this year as we continue on with the, some construction. Hopefully we will finish the sanctuary this, uh, this summer, this fall. So if you'd like to come on up to Craig, Alaska, come on up and help us as we uh, finish up the sanctuary so that they have not only education facility and, and all, but we have a worship center as well. Again, thank you First Baptist Church for your prayers, for your su financial support, and the way you have helped the work in Craig, Alaska. God bless you. Hey, First Baptist, my name is Megan, and thank you so much for being here today. Young adults, join us for a night of worship, message, and community this Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. in the FBCO parking lot. We will have pizza, fire pits, and s'mores. Bring a camping or tailgate chair with you. For more details and updates, follow us on our Instagram at FBCO Young Adults or visit our website. Join us as we host the Collingsworth family on their Just Sing tour on Sunday, March 13th at 6 p.m. in the Worship Center. This will be a free concert and a love offering will be accepted. Christian comedian Tim Hawkins is back at FBCO Sunday, March 27th at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. Tickets are now available at fbcopalaika.com events. 
Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week. Go to our website at fbcapalaka.com and on all social platforms. Join us tonight in the Worship Center at 6 p.m. for evening service. Have a great afternoon. Let's all stand, and while you're standing, let me make a quick invitation to our guest. If you're visiting with us, we are so glad you're here. Our pastor would love to meet you, and uh, there's some folks over here to your left that'll take you right to where he is. Uh, as soon as I say amen, we have a gift for you there, and he'd love to get to know you. Let's all pray. God, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. And Lord, help us to take uh, every day and every breath that you give us to make a difference for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.